originally by training, I'm a business lawyer. Um, so I teach um, mostly business law um, and a little bit of company law, which is really, really boring, but um, we try to all keep awake. But my main research and my main interest uh, is in the field of um, um, gender equality, social policy, employment law. I have uh, done a lot of work on pregnancy maternity rights and um, also I have written a book on um, reconciliation between work and family life. I have worked for the European Commission. I'm a European lawyer on top of, you know, being a lawyer. I'm a European lawyer. I've worked um, for the European Commission or in collaboration with the European Commission for um, seven years, between 2000 and 2007, writing pieces of legislation on gender equality, uh, monitoring the implementation of um, European law on gender equality in the various member states, and also helping some of the candidate country before they became member to the EU, writing their legislation in order for them to um, become um, member to the EU. Um, and um, uh, I have recently written a report, last year, written a report on um, the implementation of this legislation on gender equality in uh, and on pregnancy and maternity uh, right in the European Union, and I realized that um, this was a really quite sad to think that you know I'd spent so much time writing legislation and implementing legislation, and that in practice not a lot of it is working or that a lot of it is ignored. So it's um, it's made me think a lot about the role of the law and society and its relationship between the two. Um, a lot of what I found in Europe applies in New Zealand, but sometimes in New Zealand there are glimpses of hope because New Zealand is doing relatively well, so from time to time it's quite interesting. Um, I'm French um, and I'm also a New Zealander, but when I became a New Zealander, they didn't give me a new accent, they gave me just a new passport. <laughs> so um, I won't apologize for my accent, um, but um, be aware that sometimes you might not, um, you know, <laughs> understand what I'm saying and um, well just uh, you can ask questions at the end. So the format of this evening is I talk for about 60 minutes or until I collapse um, and uh, then there is about 20 minutes for questions and, um, and hopefully I can answer those questions. So I think that's about all my introduction. Um, oh yeah, no, well, I'm, I'll start by talking a little bit about me, a little bit more about me. So during this lecture what I'm trying to do is two things. I suppose I try to give you a little bit of background knowledge on the law, what's happening in New Zealand um, in relation to um, work-life balance, um, what does that mean for fathers, what does that mean for mothers, um, but also I'd like to challenge some of your views, and I know some, some of you in the audience are already way challenged in terms of, um, you know, gender roles, so I'm, I'm not too worried about that, but um, I think it's interesting to uh, question our ideas about gender roles. Um, so, for example, and here I start talking about me, but don't worry, I won't talk about me the whole time. But um, uh, my husband is a, an associate professor in physics, and so for our work we have to, you know, travel here and there, and we have two children. And so it's really quite interesting when, when I'm away and my husband is looking after the children, um, what happens is uh, I usually um, get emails from some of my um, Co colleagues telling me how he's doing so well. Those children are still alive. He's so brilliant. And they offer him help, you know, on the weekend, you know, do you want some help? You know, the, so this, it's really, really nice, really. But um, when, when he's away and I have the children, um, <laughs> well, I get no offer of help. So, um, you know, that's for sure. Um, but also people come to me and they say to me how, it must be so hard for him to be away from his children. <laughs> it's so expected that I will continue doing all the work and look after the children, keep them alive, of course. But this expectation that me as a good mother, well, or as a mother, as a, yeah, as a mother, I will, I will be able to do all these things. Whereas him, as a father, he's a good father because the children are alive and he's working. And, you know, and, and we know because we, we, we have some, I, I know that um, some, some of the fathers in the audience uh, will totally understand that. But also it's, uh, some, some of the fathers I talk to, they sometimes think it's really quite insulting. Like, what do you mean? Of course I'm, I'm 
you know, of course my children are fed and, you know, of course I can do all that. It doesn't require, you know, particular incredible skills. Well, it does, but, you know. Anyway, so those are kind of the expectations, but also there are limitations. One of my earliest memories is a memory of when I was seven years old. And here I was standing on the crossroad with my, my grandmother and my mother, and a bus passed, and there were a, a female bus driver, and my grandmother, horror, shock, there were a female bus driver. How can that be? This is so terrible. I mean, bus, drive, bus couldn't be driven by women. This is not acceptable. And my mother accepted that. And I, in my seven-year-old head, I thought, I thought I didn't want to drive a bus, but I thought, why couldn't I drive a bus? What is it that makes me, as a woman, unable to drive a bus? What kind of limitation is that? But also, as I grew older, in my teens, I heard a lot about how women couldn't be surgeons. Women couldn't operate somebody over 14, 17 hours. They wouldn't be strong enough to do that. And when I was in my late 20s, I had my first job in Glasgow in Strathclyde University, and um, I went away with um, uh, on, a, on a little trip um, with, a, with a professor, um, an old professor who explained to us, the students and me, how, you know, he felt very deeply uncomfortable if it was a woman flying a plane and, you know, a woman wouldn't be able to respond to emergency if there were an emergency on a plane and women shouldn't be flying planes. And I thought, and I keep hearing, you know, constantly those limitations about our possibility as women, but I also hear it about the limitation on, put on men and how, you know, men who would want to look after their children or men who wants to nurture their children, how there's something deeply wrong about you. Why would you want to look after your children? Aren't you committed to your workplace? Why, why, is it, why is it that you want to cook in the evening? Why is it that you want to spend time with your family? And I think, you know, this makes us all more poor instead of making us more rich. Um, and I, 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 I'm hoping that we can break down some of those barriers. Anyway, so enough about me. There'll be some more about me in a moment, but um, enough about me. Um, um, I think as New Zealander, we should celebrate some of, um, some of the success that we've, um, we've achieved. I'm, 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 of course, assimilating myself as a New Zealander now that I am one. So I'm thinking that, yay, we've done successful things. So we have, of course, um, we're the first country to give the right to vote to women. We have had currently, and in, in the past, and currently we've had some high political office, women in high political office, two prime ministers, um, two governor general, chief justice, still, still a, a woman, um, the attorney general and the speaker of the house have been women, have been women, the same one actually, lovely Margaret Wilson. And um, New Zealand just recently, just this year, just um, I think it was in November, uh, no, November, October, yeah, in October, late October, we got this uh, UN report that um, in New Zealand was one of the top place to be a woman in the world. Um, in fact, I think New Zealand scored place number seven. We went down one level um, um, behind more or less all of the Scandinavian countries. So this is, this is quite good. This is, um, those are indicators that things are quite good in New Zealand. Um, and also, there are other indicators which suggest that overall there are compatibility between uh, work and family life in New Zealand. So we have, for example, um, high um, participation of uh, women participate uh, quite highly in the, in the workplace. Um, they are, it's one of the highest uh, workplace participation in the OECD countries. Um, so women are, in general, quite involved in the employment, uh, in, in, the pay, in paid employment. But by comparison to men, they're still lacking behind. Um, um, what else do we have? We have a relatively, um, uh, we have a relatively, um, I don't want to say good because it's quite terrible to have a gender pay gap. We have a relatively small gender pay gap, so the average of women um, uh, pay compared to the average of uh, men is only 10% or 10 points difference. So it's, it's, not, um, it's not too terrible. It's quite terrible, in fact, and we shouldn't be happy about that, but it's not too terrible. Um, there is a really high level.
level of um, uh, education in New Zealand, uh, women, two, two thirds of um, university graduates are women in New Zealand. In fact, this is completely in line with what we have in Europe. Um, and I was recently told that in Hong Kong, there is 70%, 70 percent of the graduates are women. So it's, you know, it's, it's quite good. And we have a relatively high level of fertility rate, which is um, kind of a combination of um, um, fertility rate and immigration and, um, and, and also um, a high level of fertility rate from some groups in, uh, in New Zealand. So it's all in all, um, there is a compatibility, or it looks like there is compatibility between work and family life, and those indicators seems to be uh, quite positive in New Zealand. Um, and, it's, um, and, and at this point, I should probably say that it's maybe counterintuitive, but it's in high, it's in country where you have a high rate of female employment that you have high rate of fertility. So um, we have to work on continuing improving um, the ability for women to go to work. And here at this point, I should stand back and talk a little bit about various options. So I agree that, and I, I'm, I'm in the camp, I'm in the team that agrees that um, uh, employment is part of um, um, emancipation for women. I think that employment uh, is the route to intellectual uh, and um, social and economic independence. That's my view. It's not necessarily the view of everyone. And in fact, I talk to many people and many um, especially women think that, well, you know, they've been carer for so long and this care that they provide for, fru for free should be valued better. And I don't disagree with the fact that care should be valued better, but I disagree about the fact that maybe um, we consider that women are naturally gifted for caring. Um, I don't feel naturally gifted for caring, so that mostly is my problem, I suppose. <laughs> But the New Zealand government totally is within this line. And I think most governments are within this line of thinking that you know, we should um, provide more opportunity for women to go to paid employ employment. Um, so, what, so this is all great. What do we do? We sit back and drink some Lindauer and celebrate our success. Yay. Uh, no, not all is well in New Zealand. Um, we can do better. Um, we can use uh, women's skills a little bit better. Um, what we have is a high level of um, segregated employment sector. So a lot of women are in low paid female, female dominated occupation. Um, and um, we also have a lot of women that do a lot of the housework. Um, so men tend to do more of the paid work. Women used to, uh, tend to do more of the unpaid work in the house. Um, on average, men in New Zealand are doing pretty well in terms of housework. They're doing about two and a half hours per day. Um, and um, in the OECD country, men are doing about two hours. So men in New Zealand are doing about half an hour more per day, which means at the end of the week, at the end of the year, it's a lot more work, um, unpaid work. Um, but by comparison to women, they're doing a lot less. Women are doing over five hours of work unpaid work in the house every day. And, uh, and so that, of course, has an impact on you know, their ability to do paid employment and their ability to, um, to have a good work-life balance. Um, also, in New Zealand, although we have a very high level of employment for women, um, the employment of women that have children under the age of three is really low. It's one of the lowest in the OECD country. In fact, the only lower number are in Japan and in the Czech Republic. Um, and that is due to the fact that there is not a lot of um, childcare provided, but there is also a lot of stereotypes about who should look after the younger children. Um, and those women that work, they work a lot in part-time employment. So we have a really high rate of um, part-time, of female part-time work. So that, that is all part of the picture. Um, and of course, some groups are doing better than others. And so that's, um, you know, that's, um, um, if, if work-life balance, if you want, is, uh, you know, if, if, if it works quite well for some, um, 
professional uh, women, um, some of the uh, women in the group of the Maori and Pacific uh, ethnic um, group, they, they're doing uh, much, you know, they, they have a high fertility rate with much lower female participation, so that has an impact on their independence there. Um, there are other issues as well in New Zealand. There is this business class ceiling. So we've had, we seem to have some sort of a, a, an understanding or a, a, there is some sort of a, we, we've break, broken, broken the glass ceiling in terms of political um, issue, but in terms of um, business, it seems to be quite um, still an issue. Less than 15% of uh, women are director of the top 10, um, comp the top 100 listed company in New Zealand. So that's that's an issue, and um, and and of course, you know, recent events over the past couple of weeks have uh, showed us that there is quite some issues that are unresolved, and um, and that women are not always treated as they should be women, and. Um, um, authorities are not necessarily treating women as they should be. Anyway, so that's, um, that's the picture. Um, oh, gosh, sorry. There we are. So why should we care about work-life balance? I mean, I care about it because it's the thing I do, but why should we care about it? And why is this on the um, agenda of most country, why is it that New Zealand cares about it? There is, there is a work-life balance agenda in New Zealand, even if I have um, issues with it. There are some issues. Um, why is it more than just a woman's issue? Um, it is more than a woman's issue. Because, well, it is, part of, um, it is part of the gender equality um, issues. I mean, of course, it, it's important to women because uh, provision that enable parents to combine work and family um, are critical for women to achieve, as I said, you know, a whole sorts of independence, um, economic independence in particular. But they're also, those, those um, provisions are also essential for any strategy that aims at improving productivity and economic growth. Um, so all the states that I know of, they're trying to tap into this um, resource of women. Women should go to work because there is all these resources there. And in fact, you know, in terms of capital, as I said, women are super educated. And so therefore, the states feel that they should tap into, this, into these resources. Although I, I really hate talking about people as resources, but that's the talk we have these days. Um, there are demographic issues, major demographic issues in all of the OECD country. So I said that fertility rates in New Zealand are at replacement level, and they are, and it's not so bad. Um, however, as I said, a lot of it comes from also, uh, not just fertility rate, but also from immigration. Um, but what we have in New Zealand, like we have everywhere else, is an aging population. And that has an impact ultimately on the care issue. So all these women that have been provided providing the care for so long for free, they are in paid employment. They don't have the time to provide continuous care for, um, for a whole lot of people. So we need to think about how we manage all that. So it's really quite important for states to think about how to manage, how to provide the care for a whole lot of people, children, adult dependent, um, a whole lot of, of people who need care these days. Um, it's also important in terms of the fight against poverty. Um, women who work, they um, are less likely to be um, uh, to be uh, to, to fall into poverty later in um, in their retirement age because they'll have contributed to uh, occupational pension. So it it actually it has usually a, a later, you know, a delayed effect on, in terms of poverty, but it also has an effect on children. Women work, provide for their children um, better or are better able to provide for their children. So it, it has a direct link to um, child, child poverty. And child poverty is such an indicator that motivates states. They don't want to be the last one on the child poverty chart whenever the UN re release those charts. So child poverty is a really important one. In turn, of course, this has a lot of implication on individual well-being, and so it's, it's, you know, it's quite important. But also, work-life balance has an impact on democracy. democracy. It involves um, work-life balance, or democracy are, you know, 
based on some big concepts or big you know, pillars, such as um, equality concept or freedom, the freedom of choice. Um, and women have been lately um, able to make choice between work or care, or work and care. There's been, there's been some progress for women to be able to choose that, but men, of course, have not been able to make those choices uh, within the same extent. So men who choose to um, explore their nurturing uh, feeling or their um, ability to care have not been able to do so um, by law, but also the society, as I've said earlier on, has restricted their ability to do these sorts of things. Um, and, and, I, and, and again, there is an issue of the human um, capital and avoiding losing uh, this human capital. Uh, so women are trained, um, educated, why lose all that? Uh, but also, there is also this issue about losing the potentiality of some men being able to work in caring environment or care, um, care uh, sort of work. Anyway, so this is kind of a why we care and um, and, and, and the background to it. Now, because I'm a lawyer, <laughs> I'm going to bore you a little bit with that. I'm going to give you some sort of like legal concept background. What are we talking about when we're talking about work-life balance? In fact, I, I realize that I've put reconciliation here. There are two, in my mind, there are two concepts. There is reconciliation between work and family life, and uh, there is the concept of work-life balance. Work-life balance is for people who have the desire to reconcile their life with, you know, their working life with their other life. Um, and reconciliation is the need that some people have uh, to, um, to, to reconcile their work, their employment, their, their, sorry, their, their paid work with their care obligation. So for me, they're two different concepts. But for the sake of us, the legal concept for work-life balance and reconciliation involve those three sorts of area. Um, the leave provision and the time provision are employment law provisions. Uh, so the leave provisions, um, they, um, they deal with granting time off to parents so that they can spend time with their children or, you know, their dependent. Uh, so we're talking here in terms of children, we're talking about maternity, paternity, parental leave, um, also time off for um, uh, emergency leave, these sorts of things. Um, and the time provision, they're about making sure that the working environment uh, can be altered in order for parents to be able to work and look after their children at the same time. So we're talking about part-time, fixed-term time, um, teleworking, flexible working arrangement, these sorts of things. So this is about enabling people who already work to look after their children. So it's about changing the workplace so that they can go, they can look after their children. Um, the care strategy is quite different. This is not about making sure that people who work can look after their children. The care strategy is about making sure that people who have caring obligation can go to work. So it's about providing care. So we're talking about child care or elderly care or, you know, this commodification of the care um, business. Um, and here what we have is we replace the work that has been done for free and where we have no one that is going to be able to do it and we put a price on it. Um, and it is usually funded by the states. But we've seen in some countries that it's sometimes privatized too. So that's interesting. Now, in New Zealand, the background to work-life balance. So there is some background to it. Um, the um, Department of Labor tells us that um, work-life balance in New Zealand is about um, making sure that we have a balance between paid work, unpaid work, and personal time. And we have um, kind of an idea of what paid work is, although it's not always very clear if people work on a farm or if, um, if they are um, self-employed or if they're contributing to the family business, paid work can be a little bit dodgy to define. But okay, more or less we know what paid work is. So no, no big deal there. The um, Department of Labor is defining unpaid work but not personal time. And the boundary between those two are a little bit bizarre or a little bit not so um, clear. So um, uh, unpaid work is considered to be home duties. 
Um, so it's, uh, it's uh, things that we do that isn't paid, but it's hard. Like, OK, we'll agree that hoovering is unpaid work. Washing the dishes is unpaid work. Um, I don't know, washing the clothes, even though now we have the washing machine, which is one of the best inventions of the 20th or the 19th century, is unpaid work. We'll agree to that, hanging the clothes. Ironing, whoever irons these days, ironing is unpaid work. Okay, we'll agree on that. We'll, I mean, you'll have to agree with me. Um, personal time. What is personal time? That's a little bit... Um, more strange. So we can agree that it can be like me time, time to reflect or re-energize, spiritual needs, family times, um, times with um, family times, partner time, social time, physical health time. Um, okay, so the boundary, as I said, is a little bit difficult. So I've got these images because um, I think it's kind of a, it gives us an, a, an idea of how it works. So having dinner with the family is that personal time or is that um, uh, on work, uh, unpaid work. Well, if your children are old enough and they can eat by themselves, maybe that's family time and you have this lovely family there, like, look, they're so happy. That's family time, that's me time, that's definitely personal time. But if you have to cut their meat and feed them, they're spitting it out and... Is that family time? Is that, is that personal time or is that unpaid work? Let's take it a little bit further. There are tons of examples, but let's take it a little bit further. Shopping, grocery shopping. Well, my guess is it's unpaid work, but what if you take the family and you go to the farmer's market? So you go to the supermarket, it's unpaid work. You go to the farmer's market, that's fun. What about visiting family members? So you're visiting your grandmother, is that Family, is that, is that personal time or is that unpaid work? Um, what about coaching the, you know, it, you, you have to think about it. What, what about um, coaching the swimming team for the children? What about being a member to the PTA? What about all these examples? The, the examples are endless. So the boundary between those two are very, you know, um, 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 you know, not, not so clear, I think. So it's quite difficult to know what personal time and unpaid work is. And the definition given by people is quite different. So, um, so when I was giving you earlier on the time, you know, also of um, how many hours men and women were doing, this, this is part of it. How do we define that? Um, so anyway, we have lots of discussion about that with some of my colleagues. Um, also, part of the, this, this was a shock to me, part of the unique motivation, in fact, it's not a unique motivation in New Zealand, work-life balance in New Zealand, and I was really shocked when I found that out because I came from Europe, and for me this was shocking. But in fact, nowadays it's not shocking anymore. New Zealand work-life balance is not about gender equality, and it's not about family health. It's stated in the government's uh, web page, so it's, it's very clear that it's not about gender equality and it's not about equality between, uh, for, it's not about family health. Um, and in fact, last year, probably to the day, I was giving a paper in Singapore. They invited me to give a paper on work-life balance in Singapore. They're really interested. The government is really, really interested. There were lots of judges and lots of people from various companies. They invited me to give a paper on work-life balance in um, Singapore and comparative between the EU and, um, and New Zealand. And um, they're really interested about the topic and they're really interested in the sense of raising um, fertility rates. For them, that's what is important. But they said to me, but don't talk about gender equality. So I said, OK, I can talk about work-life balance and raising fertility rates without talking about gender equality. It was a challenge, but you know, I also kind of learned that work-life balance is not necessarily about women. It is about other things. So in New Zealand, in the government or in the, in the, the legislation, work-life balance is about two main things. It's about the retention of skilled workers 
and the attraction of skilled workers. So it's about advertising New Zealand as a place where there is work-life balance and that you can attract lots of uh, skilled workers. And it's about the contribution to sustainable workplace management. We're talking about climate change here. We're talking about having a flexible workplace, workplace arrangement so that um, there is no traffic on the road all at the same time. It's not working so well there. But it has implication. It has some implication for the legislation. I'll talk about it a little bit later. So the overall emphasis in New Zealand is on flexibility, not surprisingly, given, that, uh, given the, the focus of the legislation. Anyway, let's talk about the legislation. So what do we have in New Zealand? Uh, we have the paid parental leave um, um, the Paid Parental Leave Employment Protection Act 1987 um, and that's about the leave, the, the leave provision and we have the Breastfeeding um, uh, Act 2008. I'm not going to talk about the Breastfeeding Act at all. Um, but I can answer a question later if you have some. Um, the time provision, this is the flagship uh, legislation in New Zealand. It's the Employment Relations Flexible Working Arrangement Amendment Act 2007 which is at the moment being reviewed, well, which has been reviewed, sorry, and uh, there is a bill at the moment looking at changing some aspect of it, and I will talk about that because it's quite interesting. And when I say interesting, sometimes I think, hmm, not so um, interesting in a positive way. Anyway, and the care provision are made of a series of um, uh, provisions, um, tax provision and other sorts of provision which are uh, referred to as the working for family package um, and also uh, some government funded um, um, cost towards um, children going to uh, preschool um, from the age of three until they reach school age. Uh, so it's 20 hours per week free or kind of free. So let's talk a little bit about the Parental Leave Act because this is the um, this is an interesting one, even though it's not the flagship one. Um, so if we look, th there are two sides to it. Normally, there might not be two sides to it, but in New Zealand, there are two sides to it. So there is the side of the mother and the side of the father, or recently partner, since we have now a new legislation um, where the partner is not necessarily a father. So we, we, it's, it's open to father and partner, so that's interesting. Interesting in a positive way this time. Um, so let's look at the mothers. Um, because I don't want to bore you too much with um, uh, technical legal detail, and already you'll have enough of it, uh, I'm just going to make it simple. So in order to be eligible, parents have to have worked for, well, sorry, in order to be eligible, the mother has to have worked for one year before she can claim any of those rights. There are a number of eligibility, it could be six months and there are hours and it could be um, nothing. And if she hasn't worked, she's entitled to nothing. Anyway, but if she's worked for 12 months just before she's given birth, she's entitled to 10 days special leave. So that could be antenatal care or for, you know, sickness or, you know, just 10 days for special leave. Those days are paid. Um, uh, they're paid. Yes, they're paid. Um, uh, and then there is 14 weeks governmental, government funded and job protected paid maternity leave. Um, and New Zealand was doing really well with this for a long time. They were quite high up on the, um, on the chart of, um, you know, by comparison to other countries. But recently the Australians have introduced um, the Australian were one of two nations where they didn't have paid maternity leave and they've recently introduced paid maternity leave in, New in Australia um, but, uh, and so that kind of like made them jump to you know, higher on the list but all also on top of that they've introduced 18 weeks and paid way better than in New Zealand so we've gone down on the list. Um, but also other countries have revised their uh, paid maternity leave and so New Zealand has gone to the bottom by not revising this. Um, so this 14 weeks government funded paid maternity leave is really about, I think it's really about biology. It's about recovering from giving birth. Women need some time off from recovering. 14 weeks is probably a little too long, but it's kind of average in, um, in most OECD countries. Um, the right to um, paid parental leave uh, maternity leave um, uh, is, when I say paid, um, it's paid at the moment at 
$488 per week for 40 hours, equivalent of 40 hours uh, a, a, a week. So that's the full pay you would get. Um, and this is lower than the uh, minimum wage. The minimum wage is about 550 for 40 hours standard. Um, so the parental leave rate is lower than the OECD average, but it's also lower than the um, um, than the uh, the um, the minimum wage, and that says that um, actually production is more important than reproduction in New Zealand. Um, the payment for the maternity leave pay is done by the government. Employers do not pay anything towards it unless they want to contribute towards it, but this is completely done by the government. Um, so the idea is to not burden companies. And I understand the idea behind it, but I also think that it, um, it underpins some sorts of ideas where, again, uh, production and reproduction are not valued at the same level. And companies shouldn't be taking part of the reproduction part of society. And in a way that, um, yeah, that, that's, 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 there is a disconnection between the production. Um, women are only recognized by employer when they are doing the production, but not when they're doing the reproduction. So that's, to me, that's, that's a, a bit of a, a, a problem. Um, and also on top of that, um, women are entitled, if they've worked for 12 months, to uh, 52 weeks of uh, unpaid extended uh, leave. Now, if the mother qualifies for those rights, and if the father qualifies for those rights, then the father will be entitled to some of those rights. Um, so there is a dependence first on the mother being able to qualify for those rights before the father can claim any of those rights. Uh, so there are quite a lot of limitations on fathers in New Zealand in that sense. So in, also in order to qualify for those rights, fathers have to have worked for 12 um, months before uh, the birth of the child. Um, fathers are entitled to two weeks unpaid paternity leave. So those two weeks are kind of um, a way of giving father a chance to, to bond with their um, little one and to help the mother while she's recovering from giving birth. It's quite... Um, I don't want to say it's a standard right because it's not really a standard right. Uh, there are countries like in Germany and... Um, I, I, I uh, want to say um, Liechtenstein, but I'm not entirely sure, but definitely in Germany where there is no right to paternity leave. Um, but there are uh, countries where you have a lot more, like in Finland and in Lithuania. In Lithuania, you're entitled to one month. Fathers are entitled to one month um, paid leave, in fact. Um, in lots of the OECD country, paternity leave is paid. Um, if the mother wants, she, if she's eligible, and the father is also eligible, um, they can, he can, she can transfer the 14 weeks or some of the 14 weeks paid, so paid at this really low level, to the father or the partner. Um, and also, if the father is entitled, if the mother is entitled, and then the father is also entitled, he will be able to benefit to the 52 weeks or part of the 52 weeks. I mean, the parents have to share it or, you know, it can be transferred, etc. But um, they can benefit, father can benefit from the unpaid parental leave. Um, so what we have here is a very low take up of um, parental leave or extended parental leave by fathers in New Zealand. And it's not surprising um, because, first of all, it's dependent on so many eligibility, but also it's unpaid. And so, in a family, let's say with two parents, um, if you have one parent who will take the time off unpaid for up to a year, um, you will always, it makes economic sense to um, have that person, the one of the two parents that earns the less, to take that time off. Because, you know, then there is only one parent working for, you know, a family. Um, and because we have a gender pay gap of still 10%, um, it is almost systematically the mother who will take the time off, not only on an economic level, but also in terms of um, 
gender pressure or stereotypes, it's kind of expected that it's the mother who's going to take it. Um, it's, um, there is strong gender stereotype which makes uh, men feel that um, they're not necessarily the right, they're not considered like the natural carer for young children. And so there is a lot of social pressure that they will not take the leave because or again, you know, they might be particularly discriminated or looked at in a very strange way, or they might have to justify why. Why are you taking the time off? It's not still, we, we're still in, in this very um, interesting time where um, we have those gender um, um, roles quite defined. So what are the possible solutions? Um, one, well, first of all, it should be paid. The parental leave should be paid. Um, and it should be paid at a decent level. Um, but other things that we can think about is looking at some soft coercive measures like we have, like we find in the Scandinavian country. So in Norway and in Sweden, for example, it's um, uh, out of the year of extended maternity, uh, pa um, parental leave, fathers are expected to take two months off. And if they don't take those two months, they lose the... Um, the, the, the tax benefit for it. So there is a loss of money. So most men do take it in those countries and we have take up rate of, you know, 99% of men taking parental leave for two months in those countries. Um, what's interesting is when they take the leave. So there were uh, some studies that looked at um, Norway, for example, men take the leave mostly in October and November when it's the hunting season. <laughs> <laughs> but... <laughs> But, but there are lots of studies that look at, you know, what do men do during their, um, you know, parental leave. They do a lot of DIY. Um, and what do men do by comparison to women in terms of, you know, the, the, the work that they do. So there is a lot of uh, maybe looking after the children, playing with the children, but a lot less of the cleaning and things like that. So it's, you know, those things are not clear cut. They, they really need to be looked at. Um, we can also look at... Um, um, looking at who actually is caring for the children and opening some of those rights to maybe grandparents or family members that actually look at the parents. And I think in New Zealand, at least in relation to those rights, we don't have this opening. But we have it in terms of the flexible working arrangement. So let's go to that. So that's about organizing time differently. We have this... Um, right to request flexible working hours in New Zealand since 2007. This is the flagship um, uh, of work-life balance in New Zealand. And in fact, it's been a very interesting legislation. It's been based, it's been copied from the, it's been copied and adapted from the UK legislation, but it's been copied with a twist and it's been really interesting. And it's been really good for me to come out to the UK and other countries to talk about it because people think it's really interesting. There is a, a big, uh, on, face it, on face is not on um, parents, but on carers. And that's really interesting. So this is about the possibility for people who care people who have a care obligation to request flexible working arrangements. So they can make this request. They have to make it. It's quite heavy. They have to make it in writing. They can only make the request once a year. And, um, um, and, you know, and the employer has the right to consider the demand, but not, um, uh, there is no obligation for the, for the employer to, um, to, to accept the demand. Um, and there is an obligation for the employer to consider the demand within three months. But what's interesting is this focus on care. So, it doesn't have, it's not about parents, it's not about, um, you know, it's, it's about anyone who has a care obligation. So that's really quite interesting. Um, some of the problem associated with it is that it's a lot focused on the market. So it's, it's okay for the business to say, no, actually, we can't accommodate you because, well, the business doesn't work without you working those hours. Um, and parents have again, very limited control over flexibility, flexible working arrangement. They have the right to request, but they don't have the right to, um, to, 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 to enforce this right. So, you know, if the employer says no, and even if it's not um, right, even if it's unfair, the process for, I mean, you can't go anywhere with it. I think the, um, the, the penalty is so low and so, 
you know, inconsequential, that it's not interesting. But also, once you have changed your conditions of employment, you've changed your contract of employment. So that's really important. So if you request flexible working arrangement and you're granted flexible working arrangement, so you might go, let's say, on part-time, you might have lost your full-time job. And so once the situation of the care changed, so let's say your child goes to school, uh, you can't go back to your full-time work. You have to then request to change again, and the employer can say no. So it's a, it's a change, a definite change on your contract of employment. So that's really quite important. Um, the um, type of job that are normally connected with flexibility, you know, those jobs like um, people, who are, people who have high skills, they usually can ask their employer. They usually, they don't need this kind of legislation. Those, the, the employer want to retain those people with skills, they will grant the flexible working arrangement. And a lot of those jobs actually don't really need this legislation. But the people who need the most this legislation are people in low skills job and, and they're the ones who won't be able to ask for those flexibility. Um, and one of the consequences of the request for flexible work arrangement is this really high level of part-time work for women in New Zealand. 35%, which is uh, one of the highest in the OECD. I think that uh, only the Netherlands has a higher rate. Um, and there we have the uh, Flexible Working Arrangement Bill 2013. So it simplifies the procedure and it means that you can ask how many times you want. You're not limited to once a year. And the employer has to respond within a month, not three months anymore. But the most important part of this bill is that it opens this request of flexible arrangement, not just to people who have caring, uh, caregiving obligation, but to anyone. And so when I was, um, and so when, when you're thinking about it, you know, you might work for a small company um, and some, it's a man, but it doesn't have a man. I'm going to move this hand because it's badly strategically placed. Um, <laughs> but um, one of the worker might ask for flexible working arrangement to say, go play golf, and therefore might not work, let's say, on Friday. This is a small company, and then suddenly one of the um, workers in that small company might have a child, or they might have a member of their family who needs care, you know, an elderly or somebody need care. And that other worker will go to see the employer and say, well, I need the flexible working arrangement to look after this person, my child, my, you know, whoever, somebody I need to care for. And the employer will say, sorry, we can't move anymore. We can't, we can't give it to you because somebody already has the flexible working arrangement. And so it gives the employer very little space. But here what we have is that the one who will benefit from the flexible working arrangement are not the one who need the care. And that's where you know, I was making the, the difference between um, reconciliation and work-life balance. I think for me it's very different. The intention here in this bill is to um, reduce the um, gap between the perceived um, uh, privilege that uh, people with care have, you know, people with care, they have so much privilege. Look at all this leave they have, you know, the leave, the parental leave and all that. People with children, they have so much leave. And then they have this right to flexible working arrangement. So a lot of employees, or possibly it's perceived that a lot of people without children, without care obligation, felt left out from those privilege. I don't think it's a privilege to have um, um, parental leave myself, but this is what, what this legislation is intending to do. In fact, what happened is, in fact, it, in fact, what happened is that it devalues the care, and that's what is important, I think, here. Um, yeah, because, um, yes, well, it devalues care. Anyway. Let's move to the next one because I want to finish this and you don't want to um, completely be bored with it. The last part of it is the care uh, provision in New Zealand. The care provision is um, made up of this uh, working for family scheme uh, which was created in 2004. The intention is fabulous. I really like the intention behind it. It's really interesting. It's about supporting family work to receive... Oops supporting family work to receive um, an adequate 
um, um, income. So it's really quite interesting. Um, so it entitles family to a minimum level of payment um, uh, and, and it's linked to them working. So family work, people who work will be entitled to a decent level of uh, payment. It's about making sure that children do not fall in poverty. Um, it's about making sure that, you know, work pays. So it's really quite interesting, but it has had some sort of unintended consequences for women. Um, in fact, one of the main consequences for women is that it keeps women at home. It encouraged the one or the one and a half income. So it encouraged traditional family where the man goes out to work and the woman stays at home and look after, um, after the children. So it entrenches women into caring role. What's worse, I think, is that it's really underpinned by very mm, dodgy, moralistic sorts of values. So it's very valued for mothers who are in a family with two uh, parents to stay at home and look after their children. But parents in single family, they also have to work in order to qualify for this help, for this um, family, for this uh, working for family package. And that means that um, it makes a moral statement on the value of care. So it's very valued for mothers in traditional family role to care for their children. But if they are single mothers, because most single parents are single mothers, um, well, staying at home to look after their children is absolutely not valued. It's not good at all. What are they doing? It's useless. They should go out to work. So working production is more important, again, than looking after their children. So it makes um, sort of like a moral statement between those two sorts of family. And I think it's, well, it's sad. And um, I... I have only two slides left, so I'll, uh, I'll, um, I'll talk a little bit about um, what I found in the course of my research um, in New Zealand, but elsewhere. And New Zealand is not so different than anywhere else. What we have is we have a very comprehensive legislation in New Zealand. So we can't blame the legislation. The legislation is quite comprehensive. It's quite, um, it's quite good. It's quite well written. It's, it's not, we don't have major issue with it. Um, but what we have is we have a huge amount of discrimination associated with uh, pregnancy, maternity, and becoming a parent in New Zealand. Um, in New Zealand and elsewhere, in fact. Um, there, is a, there is a high level of invisible discrimination where uh, women who become pregnant or women who return to work after they've had their children or parents in general, but it does happen to women. Um, they are um, pushed out of the um, workplace. They are um, encouraged to stay with their children. And there is very little... Um, uh, th there is not so much case law or uh, people who fight it for two reasons. One of the reasons, it's always the same issue. It's quite difficult to take a case, to make it work. It's, it's cumbersome, it's expensive, it's scary for lots of people. And you just had a baby, the last thing you want to do is go to court or you know, start legal procedure. Um, but also there is, again, this um, everyone around you that kind of... Uh, um, think that probably you've just had a baby, your place is not at work, your place is with this baby. Um, and so you start to believe it. In fact, I, uh, I'm going to talk about myself again. When I had my second child in New Zealand, um, I was employed by, the, by a UK university, but I had my child in New Zealand, my second one. And I was in this baby group, and all of the women in the baby group had given up their job. And me, after my 16 weeks maternity leave, I went back to work. And, um, and I put my child in this lovely nursery on campus. It's a fabulous nursery. I never felt like I was you know, doing him harm. But um, I was surrounded by these women. And they never said anything bad to me. But they said, oh, I chose to stay with my child because it's more important. It's, it's for his own good or, their, or her own good. And I felt like the most horrible mother. And everywhere I looked, all the women had given up their jobs. And I, I, did, I had to really hardly look for women who had continued or had decided to continue working, and a lot of them were uh, foreigners. Um, so it was, it was for me, it was quite a, a social um, issue um, that you know, like you, you feel like, well, your place is probably not at work. So everyone thinks that you're the mother, so therefore you should be at home 
And, and, and so you won't fight for your place at work because you start to believe this is the truth. I was ringing my parents and saying how this is, I, I feel like I'm a bad mother, but of course in France everyone works after their maternity leave. So they didn't understand what I was talking about. Anyway, so that's, that's part of the reason why there is, you know, this, there is important cultural gender stereotypes. And, um, and if a father were to choose to stay home in the early years of the, of the babies, same thing happened. Uh, a lot of fathers are talking about how it's very difficult to actually attend baby group because they're all made of women. It's just difficult. Anyway, some of the other some of the other things that we 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 have found that I have found um, they are just you know no one will be surprised. Um, the public sector is usually more feminized than the private sector, and it's also uh, seen as one of the sector that manages um, maternity, pregnancy issues, baby stuff. Uh, so the public sector is viewed as this sector that manages um, women stuff. Um, and small and larger enterprise in New Zealand, it's very interesting. So small enterprises are usually not very good at respecting the law. Um, small enterprises, particularly in New Zealand, think that, well, they don't have to follow the law, these laws. Uh, in relation to pregnancy, maternity, parental leave, parent, you know, flexible working arrangement. A lot of the small company feel they can um, get away with it. And they do, um, by comparison to larger enterprise. Um, and this is due to the fact that um, there is no transparency, very little good governance, and um, uh, a lot uh, less sc scrutiny in small enterprise. It's also due to the fact that um, uh, that there are usually two sorts of legislation. In lots of legislation, you know, it says, oh, le company over so many employees will have to do that, and the rest, oh, well, well, they can get away with it. So we, having these two tier sorts of legislation is not helpful. But we have this argument in New Zealand. I hear it all the time, so I'm telling you right away, you can't ask this question. Um, but we have a lot of small companies in New Zealand. It's so expensive. So what? We just get paralyzed because we have small companies in New Zealand. Small companies in New Zealand are hugely flexible on so many levels. Why shouldn't they be flexible about that too? To me, it's not an argument. I also hear, and so you can't ask this question either, we are a small country, so we can't do it. <laughs> Didn't you see my first few slides? All the things we've done? We're doing far better than Australia. We're doing far better than, New, than the US. We're doing far better than a lot of places. Being a small country is not, is not equivalent to doing nothing. So we can do a lot as a small country. And small companies are not exempted from a lot of other things. They pay their tax like everyone else. They benefit from the roads like everyone else. They benefit from consumer like everyone else. So it's not a good enough excuse in my mind for them to misbehave in relation to uh, gender equality or work-life balance in general. Some of the things that I've um, looked at also is that um, is about health and safety and how health and safety is often used as a way of excluding women, as, as a way of excluding new parents, but women in particular. It's about this issue of control. And I've talked in the media a little bit about it on, uh, in relation to uh, pregnant women and the airline industry. So there's been quite a few a pro about that, um, where you know women who are pregnant um, sometimes are banned from traveling by the airline industry because because there is no reason because the airline industry thinks they can do, they can say no, you can't fly or you need to show a certificate. There is no medical, there is no um, um, research that show that pregnant women cannot fly. Uh, in general, if things are good. Um, so, but, but this happened also at work. You know, employers will say, oh, you know, there are some chemicals or, you know, there are some stress in this work. You can't continue to work, so you need to leave. So this is for the good of the woman and the good of the pregnant woman, usually. Anyway, so those are some of the findings that I have come across. Now, this is my conclusion. Where do we go from there? And, uh, you know, this is the big question. This is the vision, to value raising pigs more than do we value raising children. Production, is it more important than reproduction in our society? Employers will argue systematically um, that um, 
we have so many rights and those rights are so costly and it is because we have those rights that there is discrimination it is because we have all these rights that women cannot get to get, cannot get to you know cannot get employment or that they are dismissed and then employees will say well no we need more rights in order to be able to access employment and stay in employment so what do we do from, from what I've been able to look at, it's not because we have rights that there is discrimination. In fact, if we had less rights, the chances we'd have more discrimination. Um, so it's not about that, but ultimately it's about where do we place the market. Sorry, I'm going to sound a little bit revolutionary here, but you know, where do we place the market? And there are some that argue that the market is above everything. It's above science, you know, climate change. Before, what the market will deal with it. We don't believe in the in climate change. This is science. It's under the market. Human rights? No, it's under the market. Um, gender equality? No. Work-life balance? All that is under the market. So we have this vision. Personally, I think it's an outdated and very scary vision of society and the market. Um, in reality, we have to recognize that we're all connected, and we all, at some point, we all have been. You know, in, we, we all have been dependent, We've all ha we all have been babies, and there is a chance that we will need some care later in life, or we might have an accident, an illness, there will be a moment where we need care. So autonomy is not the only way of valuing um, um, people in our society, I think. And what's really quite encouraging is to look, I've worked with a few big, very large global companies that are really taking on board this idea of diversity um, in, a, in, in a way that is, um, you know, that is looking at resilience in the long term, and um, they're looking at, you know, making sure that there is flexibility. And so it's quite encouraging to see that actually big, large global companies are thinking about those issues nowadays, and they're looking at ways of encouraging women, parents, um, fathers to, um, to work and to also combine their um, life with it. So that's quite interesting. And of course, I always have this question about the role of law because the role of the law, because I think it's been failing us a lot. But anyway, so that's, that's about my talk and I'm one minute overdue. So you have some time now to talk.